Chapter 2 The tradition of the apprenticeship year at Belcaran Academy of Wizardry is almost as old as the academy itself. Its premise is simple. After four years of training and study with professors and other students on the main campus, the apprentice trains for a year by themselves under a master wizard on another world. The master provides lectures and hands-on education in whatever subject he is expert, as well as room and board. In return, the apprentice provides a year of free labor, taking care of the chores and practicalities that, while necessary, distract the master from his own studies and duties to the people of his domain. If the student successfully completes their assignment, the student graduates and moves on to a career or more schooling. Whether this arrangement is actually worthwhile to the apprentices has been a subject of much debate over the centuries, but as the ones who write the curriculum at the academy are themselves master wizards who rely on a steady stream of fresh-faced apprentices to do their dishes, these debates fizzle like an underbrewed sparkler potion. From the article Apprenticeship by Apprentice Penelope Water Cleanser, Belcaran Academy Data Stream Archives. Ninian was debating the merits of the apprenticeship system herself while she remained slouched on the couch in Saligrix's sitting room. After an acceptable interval of dazed self pity, the grumble of her stomach forced her to rise and approach the wall niche. Uh, she said with uncertainty into the ether, vapor bean tacos? There was a pause long enough that Ninian was about to try again, and then a puff of crimson smoke appeared with a loud crack. The cloud cleared to reveal a white plate and three limp, sad-looking tacos. Unsure of the proper etiquette with kitchen demons, she called out, Thank you? After returning the tea tray to the niche as instructed, which vanished in a cloud of smoke, she grabbed her plate of tacos, her satchel, and gossamer, and braved the fire-charm-choked staircase up to the next level of the tower and the promised apprentice's room. Ninian, hands full, pushed open the door with her shoulder. The furnishings were simple. A bed, a desk, a trunk. Behind a dingy curtain that hung from the ceiling was a small claw-footed bathtub and a garter robe. Mushrooms sprouted where the wall met the floor, and the unmade bed was thick with damp. Gossima hopped under the bed and put his hands on his head as if to hide from the mess. If the events of the last hour had not already made it clear, Saligrix had not been expecting her. She sat on the bed and ate her tacos, which were mushy and bland. She handed the plate over to Gossima to lick clean. There was no way she could sleep in this room in its current condition. She cast a simple drying spell, chanting the words and folding her fingers in a specific arrangement— A glowing disc appeared in her palm, which she waved over all the surfaces in the room to banish the wet. Books and loose parchment splayed across the desk, which she dried and organized into a stack. Whoever had used this room last, Redondo, presumably, if there had not been another apprentice in the intervening years that Saligrix had forgotten, had terrible, basically illegible handwriting, and even where water had not blurred the ink, she could not read the notes. There was only one sheaf written with care and affixed to the wall that seemed impervious. Chores. Clean workrooms. Update ingredient inventory. Prepare meals. Crossed out. Wash dishes. Crossed out. Repair masonry. Recharge torches. Secure perimeter. Receive deliveries. The thought of spending a year in this tower with that list of dreary tasks filled her with dread, to say nothing of the subtle threat of secure perimeter. At least prepare meals and wash dishes were crossed out. She wondered why. After the desk, she turned her attention to the trunk, which she found unlocked but, curiously, still full of belongings. A full set of clothing, socks, underwear, more books, and a stack of business cards that read, in silver letters on black paper, Rodondo Vecchi, Demonologist. She gathered all the items into her arms and wondered why anyone would leave all their belongings behind after their apprenticeship. Feeling the fine quality of a robe, her imagination kicked into gear, and she thought she had a theory. Sometimes, when a student from a wealthy family graduated from Belcaran, they left all their things behind because they could just acquire more at home, Remaining students often divided up these abandoned items by seniority or by lot. 
Perhaps Rodondo's family was similarly wealthy, and he had left his belongings behind for the taking. Still, it was strange. Regardless of the reason for the abandoned trunk, unfortunately for Ninian, his clothes were way too big for her. There was, however, a soft and warm-looking scarf, which she kept for herself before stashing the rest of his things behind the bathtub and out of sight. After storing her own belongings in the trunk and tidying up the rest of the room, she looked around to take stock. She wasn't ready to get comfortable, but the room would do for now. Through the window, which she would later learn was the only window in the entire tower, she watched the last vestiges of the orange gas giant set over the purple forest. The neighboring brilliant moon glowed bright and full and tinged the woods with silvery blue light. When it got dark, Ninian cast a light spell in the empty cage on the ceiling and adjusted it to a gentle yellow. She ran a bath, but found out it never got warmer than frigid, so instead she lay on the bed to cuddle with Gossima and read her data stream messages. After sending messages to her parents and her friend Drusilla to let them know she had arrived safely, she brought up the search feature for the Belkaran Academy data stream archives. How to get an apprenticeship reassignment. Despite many hours of searching, late into the night, Ninian did not find the answers she sought. The Belcaran Apprenticeship Program was an institution steeped in tradition, and basically the only way to get a new assignment was if the master died, which, given the median age of the masters, happened often enough to mention. She snapped her device off and flopped onto the bed. Had she done something to deserve the worst possible apprenticeship placement? Had she offended Dean Felchbrook? As she scoured her memory... With a sinking feeling that had been all too common today, she realized she had. Ninian stepped into Dean Felchbrook's office, closing the door behind her, and the hubbub of students in the halls outside immediately quieted to silence. The only remaining sound was the ticking of the atomic grandfather clock on the wall. The dean flicked his eyes up from a massive, sigil-filled tome on his desk. "'Do you have an appointment?' His voice was high and worn, like a well-oiled bowstring. Ah, yes, let me. Ninian rubbaged in her bag for the enchanted parchment. Not finding it immediately, she set her bag on the dean's desk for leverage. I know it's in here somewhere. The dean pursed his already thin lips, not amused. His face was long and thin, as if imprinted into taffy and then stretched out. Unlike taffy, however, there was nothing sweet about Dean Falchbrook. Ninian felt her fingers grasp the sought-after slip. Gotcha! She pulled out the parchment, but as she did so, the contents of her bag spilled onto the dean's desk. So sorry, she said, and began shoveling her books and scrolls back into her bag. To her horror, she realized her sketchbook had fallen open, and to double her horror, it had opened up directly to the page where she had doodled caricatures of the Belcaran staff as characters from her favorite novel. Dean Falchbrook's eyes narrowed. He looked directly at Ninian's cartoon version of himself, who she had regrettably cast as the novel's vampire villain. Ninian quickly shoved the sketchbook into her bag, hoping he hadn't gotten a good look. She took her seat and placed the enchanted parchment into a shallow dish at the corner of the dean's desk, where it disintegrated in licks of purple flame. I did not realize Belcarin offered a course in cartooning, the dean said, mirthlessly, dashing Ninian's hopes like glass on slate. Ninian's cheeks flushed. Oh, you know, just a little imaginative sketching. Maybe I'll submit it to the school newspaper. She laughed, as if to say, what a small, silly thing that we're going to put behind us right now and never speak of again. She'd expected the dean to laugh along, or at least smile. Instead, he seemed almost offended. Maybe it had been a mistake to lighten the mood. Or not, Ninian said quickly. She nervously tucked a strand of black hair behind her ear. She leaned sideways in her chair in a pose that, she imagined, a relaxed person would find themselves in. Burning it might be another good option. Dean Falchbrook frowned. Such jokes, if you can call them that, might play well in the quad with the other truants, but you should know that I myself am part vampire, and as such I find your bizarre depiction personally offensive. Ninian shrank behind the intensity of his gaze. She objected to the dean's characterization of her as a truant, as she was one of the top-ranked students at the academy, but she felt that this precise moment was not the time to argue semantics, nor to explain the fictional context of a character from Almet's adventures. 
After four years at Belcarran, how could she not have realized that the dean was part vampire? Now, of course, she could see it in his pale skin, the shape of his ears, and, yes, the hint of fangs in his teeth. Stupid, Neen, stupid. She wanted to disappear, but she forced herself instead to meet the dean's eyes. I apologize, she said, and as she spoke, she wove the subtle notes of a calming spell into her speech. It was supposed to be for relaxing creatures as you treated them, but she had used it on people before, and it had turned down the temperature of more than one intense conversation. I'll be more mindful of my future doodling. The tilt of the dean's eyebrows and the way the corners of his mouth turned down suggested that she had placated his ire for now, by spell or otherwise. Apology accepted, he said. As a student of Belcarran Academy of Wizardry, your behavior reflects not only on yourself, but on the illustrious institution you represent. Understood? Ninian nodded. Very well. His eyes turned to the wisps of smoke rising from her burning appointment parchment and scanned them as if reading the cast bones of an oracle. So I see you're seeking an apprenticeship placement, if I'm not mistaken. Ninian nodded again. She figured it would be best to speak as little as possible from this point forward. Dean Falchbrook tapped on the data stream device embedded in his hardwood desk. It took him more than one try before a hologram of Ninian's student profile popped up in front of him, backwards from her perspective. I'm still not used to these things, the dean muttered, gesturing to the device. Back in my days at the academy, we used enchanted parchment for everything. I'm not sure what we've gained. His thoughts trailed off as he read over her file. Ninian sat in silence. The warm smell of leather and parchment from the book-lined walls filled the room. Ninian Lightcaster, he read out, pronouncing each syllable. My friends call me Neens, she offered. The dean looked at her as if she had made a rude noise and returned his attention to her file. With a surname like that, you must have an aptitude for optical magic. Ninian nodded. That's my family's affinity, but I've chosen to study creature healing, the dean read, a suitably rigorous discipline. What are your plans for after graduation? I'm hoping to join the research department here at Belcarin and study new creature healing techniques in the lab. The dean looked at her carefully. You do realize you'll need two letters to even be considered. Ninian nodded. I've already got a professor's letter. Last semester, I helped Professor Hemnel with the beached nebula whales on Trantis as my independent study. She said that was more than enough to qualify. The dean stroked his chin. Ah, yes, I remember this now. That was quite the feather in Belcarin's cap. He looked her over again, as if reassessing his first impression. You must be hoping for a master's letter, then. Ninian nodded again, but then felt like she had been nodding too much, so stopped. Ambitious. The dean tapped his data stream device, and the projection snapped off. He steepled his fingers and drew a breath. Now, we make every effort to match each apprentice with a master in the same discipline. However, as you might imagine, based on the particular pool of applicants and the availability of the masters, this does not always happen. When disciplines do not align, we encourage students to seek interdisciplinary connections— Matching master and apprentice is not an exact science. There are many factors to consider, as I have said. And you are seeking a master's letter. I will put you in the pool with the other apprenticeship candidates. Unless there is something else you require, I have another appointment. Ninian shook her head, rose, and went to the door. Thank you, Dean. The Dean smiled, and now there was no question as to the vampire portion of his lineage. Best of luck with your apprenticeship, Neens. Of course, Ninian couldn't prove that Dean Felchbrook had purposely assigned her to a senile master on a backwater moon for an unintentionally offensive drawing of himself, but his pointed use of her nickname echoed in her mind, and she couldn't shake her lingering doubts. This also meant, even if she could find a legitimate reason to be reassigned, that the Dean was unlikely to be sympathetic to her case. Would she be able to procure a master's letter from Salagrix? It depended on how easily impressed he was. Then there was the question of Saligrix's discipline, which he had not mentioned in their brief conversation earlier. Was he a creature healer? If so, that might make the year worth it, and that master's letter practically guaranteed. If not, 
it would be a very long year.